Charles Shaughnessy, it is great to see you again. Terrific to see you, Craig, too. We are speaking with aristocracy now. 15 years ago, you became the fifth Baron of Shaughnessy. And if I should be addressing you correctly, um, the Right Honourable, the Lord Shaughnessy, is, is that kind of right? Uh, you wouldn't be Right Honourable. It's, it's just Lord Shaughnessy, fifth Baron Shaughnessy of okay. Montreal and Ashford County Limerick is the full title. Of course, of you being... Um, a baron. Of course, you went to very posh Eton. But some of your fans on The Nanny were not convinced that your British accent was actually rigididge, that it was real. They didn't think you were doing a good enough British accent. Is that right? They actually would would ask why I didn't take lessons from Danny Davis, who was obviously <laughs> really British. Um, and it was like ridiculous to have a real Englishman there. And this phony Englishman doesn't... Uh, who's playing the Englishman can't, you know, why don't you get Danny Davis to tell you how to speak English? Of course, Danny Davis is from Little Rock, Arkansas, and I'm from London. You know, you think about The Nanny, an absolute tour de force, wonderful writing, fabulous cast. Was it fun to make? Comedy is never as much fun as it looked. It's, it, it looks fantastic and it looks fun. And that's the, that's the game. That's the magic is you make it look like you're all having fun. But it's very detailed. You're doing a whole week of rehearsals on 24 minutes of material. So you're going over and over the jokes and the gags, and it's hard to keep them fresh, um, you know, time and time again. Um, so it's not quite as fun as it looks. You know, we had a lot of fun. It was, I mean, the, the best thing for me were all the guest stars, you know, to actually get to work with Donald O'Connor and, uh, Elizabeth Taylor and Elton John. I mean, crazy guest stars. Every week we'd sort of rush to the script to see who was in it this week. Um, so yeah, it was a lot of fun, but it's, it's, it's work. It's, it's not as much fun to do as a soap. The soap is much more fun because it's, you do a whole new show in a day. Um, it moves very fast. The characters are always moving and changing. Whereas on a on a on a uh, a um, sitcom, you want the characters to stay pretty much the same. They have their catchphrases. You don't want any character arcs. You want it. You know, if you look at Maxwell and Fran in the first episode, it's basically Maxwell and Fran in season five. <laughs> so that can be for an actor. That's not um, as much fun to do. But listen, I don't want to knock it. I'm I'm so um, I'm so happy and, and thrilled that it's as popular as it is. And that especially over the last few years, I hear from fans all over how it's got them through these pretty dark times because they knew they could have a laugh and a smile. Um, uh, and that's very rewarding. I mean, you can't, I can't say enough how rewarding that is to hear that. It was you, it was Fran, it was Renee oh Taylor. It was just such an exquisite cast. But you did all have the most impeccable comedy timing. Was that hard to find in the beginning? No, you know, it was, there was a certain magic sometimes happens for no reason, the sort of blend of actors and the blend of characters they were playing with some very smart writing. Um, you know, everything, the cartoon beginning, the theme song, um, the blend of the actors, the way they would put two characters together and was always a different chemistry, whether it's Niles and Cece, Cece and Fran, Fran and Maxwell, Maxwell and Niles. I mean, it always had different blends. Um, and very quickly, the writers picked up on people's rhythms and people's um, quirks and would write to them. So that by the middle of the first season, they were writing to the actors. So it was like a kind of, um, oh yeah, a real collaboration. So it was, yeah, and, and, and it sort of happened without us knowing. It was just, we just had fun and knew that we were um, enjoying acting with each other. And, and this sort of phenomenon happened. And it works today. You watch them. I watch sometimes, I'll catch one today. And it's funny, 25 years later. Oh, it's fabulous. It wasn't in a time, you know, you can take it out of its time frame, take it out of its culture. You can put it in China. You can put it in Spain. You can put it anywhere. And it's the same thing. It's a cheeky servant with the master, you know, the servant from the um, hinterland and the sort of sophisticated family. It works 
in any culture, in any time frame. So it'll last forever, I think. And it went to air, first of all, in 1993. So that's coming on to 30 years. And people still love it. There is so much ongoing talk about a reunion, about a nanny movie. We've seen the nanny um, on Broadway. It is still current. People love it. That must be satisfying. It is. I mean, it's... uh, I I get a little nervous when you try to... um, to take something, a classic, out of the cupboard, dust it off, and you know, remake it. Um, it was so perfect. I just don't know why you would mess with it and try to have us actors who are now 30 years older stuffed into that. <laughs> you know, it's not going to be the same. I get it. If you recast it as a Broadway musical, that makes complete sense to me because it's basically the sound of music anyway. That makes a lot of sense. But to try to reboot a TV show, I don't know how that works. There is one way it could work, and I can't tell you because Fran shared it with me some time ago, um, that would work. It's a clever, clever idea, but um, it needs a lot of moving parts. But mm-hmm. otherwise, uh, I, I just don't know how, how you would do it. I think it'll last forever in reruns, but a reboot, I don't know. We'll see. One of my favourite episodes was when Dame Elizabeth Taylor came to visit. Now, of course, you talked about some of the great guest stars, and we'll talk about some more of those in a moment. But what was it like having that Hollywood queen come pay a oh. visit to the nanny? I mean, it was literally royalty. I mean... It was almost like the Secret Service arrived and sort of, you know, fanned out across the studios. There was, you know, things were locked down. Um, uh, She sort of swept in with her entourage and her dog. Um, I can't even remember. I think there was like a very brief rehearsal. Um, And she was wonderful. She was lovely at the center of it. She was um, um, just sweet. Uh, But you were definitely in the presence of royalty. No question about it. And interesting enough, she was on GH. I didn't realize this, but she was yes. played Helena Cassidyne. Correct. What did she look like up close, Charles? Was she absolutely exquisitely beautiful? Yeah, I mean, she has those just unreal eyes, you know, so you just can't take your eyes off that. I mean, this the, the, her eyes are just exquisite. And um, there's, there's a kind of, you know, like someone like that, because you've seen her through the ages on screen, there's an aura and a mystique and you can't help but see the history and see who she was and is, as well as her present, her current physical presence. It's like everything that comes with it. Um, And uh, kind of like meeting the queen, you know, the queen, I'm sure that she is physically, you know, imposing, but there's so much more to it. And Elizabeth oh. Taylor, there's so much more, but she was, yeah, she's exquisite. Uh, she was um, lovely uh, to look at and very, very sweet, very charming, very normal, very down to earth. You know, all this kind of circus was going on around her, um, but she didn't have any airs or graces. You know, she just was there to play a part and enjoyed it. Did everyone line up for selfies? Yeah, there weren't really selfies, as I remember in those days. They certainly lined up um, (laughs) to sort of just gaze and gawk and uh, (laughs) nod. You know, there was a little bowing and curtsying going on. Ironically, years later, you landed a role on uh, a telly movie called Liz and Dick, as I recall it. It was Lindsay Lohan as Elizabeth Taylor and Australia's Grand Bowler as Richard Burton. And you played um, you played a director in that, didn't you? Anthony Asquith, as I recall? Anthony Asquith, yes, That's who right. directed them in the VIPs and was having terrible trouble with them, um, particularly with Liz, who would yeah. just not come out of her trailer um, and would be having screaming matches with Richard. And it was a nightmare. Um, and the sort of irony was at the time, the director of the TV movie was having the same issues with poor Lindsay. <laughs> so it was like art imitating life to it. And I, you know, I have to say, I have sort of two minds, right? Because I think it's almost like they made that movie intentionally for it to be a car wreck. They sort of counted on the publicity 
yeah. more than wanting to make a good movie. It's like, wow, let's make this because it's going to be a car wreck. Yeah. And that will get publicity for this thing. So I was a little dubious about the whole operation because I had worked with Lindsay before. When she was younger, I did get a clue, a Disney movie with her, and she could not have been sweeter. And in fact, um, later when she did Freaky Friday, my, my kids were a huge, my youngest was a huge fan of hers, obviously. And we went to see the premiere of Freaky Friday and there was a big do afterwards. And my youngest, who brought a friend with her, said, you know, can we meet Lindsay? Can we? And I said, look, honey, you know, she's very busy. There's the press. It's a premiere. It's going to be really hard, but I'll see if there's any way. We walked in and there she was in the middle of the room, surrounded by press and handlers. And she just caught sight of me and went, Charlie. Like, and I hadn't worked with her for like two or three years. Yeah, she went, Charlie. Cool. And I went, hi, Lindsay. You know, my kids. And she went, oh bring them in. So we went into this circle. She told all the photographers to back off, knelt down and did pictures with the two kids and signed their programs, gave them a hug and then said, thank you so much for coming to see the movie. Bye now, you know, blew them a kiss and went back to her press. And of course, my kids were just in heaven. And I thought, how classy is yep. that? Months later, you know, the, the wheels came off and it was just so, so tragic. Um, you mentioned the roll call of amazing guest stars on The Nanny. Bette Midler, Joan Collins, as I recall it, Ray Charles. But Ray Charles playing there was yeah, Donald Trump. Friend. And Donald Trump. I know. Let me tell you a funny story about him. They wrote him as a millionaire. You know, uh, uh, you know Fran is impressed because he's a millionaire. And uh, he said, I want to be, it needs to be billionaire. And it didn't work for the joke to be billionaire. And they didn't want him to dictate what they'd call him. So they settled on gazillionaire. <laughs> and he was happy with that. Yep. So the ego had landed even then. It was crazy. My, one of my favorites was Donald O'Connor. Oh, you know, wow. Actually do a quick little soft shoe shuffle with Donald yeah. O'Connor. I mean, you know. And, and the great Ray Charles, you know. And Ray Charles, yeah. That's and great. doing and not even appearing as Rachel, he appeared as Yedda's boyfriend, as yeah. a sort of character for like four or five episodes. And they did, you know, he was fine with all these blind jokes. They had him sort of tripping over the furniture and things. <laughs> and he was just such, he was so up for it. He was great. It's very clear to everybody that you and Fran got on so well. You know, remarkable chemistry on screen. What's right. the real Fran Drescher like, Charles? Oh, she, you know, she's really uh, a force of nature. She's such a big personality, a big, generous heart. Um, when we first started uh, in the first week of rehearsal, she made sure that um, she came with a big bowl of chili or a big pot oh. of spaghetti to feed us all, make sure she said it's important you were all fed. You know, she was our Jewish mama yes. um, in those early days of rehearsals. And just tireless. I mean, she wrote it, she uh, acted in it, she um, was involved in every decision about everything, you know, really micromanaging because she had a very clear vision of what it needed to be. Uh, she was extraordinary, you know, just um, and, and, and taking on the network and taking on the studio, demanding better time slots, you know, it's, it's, it's not easy to do that. Oh, no, she was kind of like almost a reincarnation of Lucille Ball, wasn't she? She was yeah. not just the star no, they, of this fabulous sitcom, but she was such a dynamic force behind the scenes. It was um, a little bit like Lucy. You know, she, 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 uh, they, they studied Lucy. She and Peter studied Lucy, the, the Lucy show, very carefully. And you can see a lot of homage. They saw it as much, very much an homage to Lucy. So... Um, it wasn't an accident and it was um, very conscious, uh, the, the character that she came up with, who sort of gets in the way of Maxwell's, you know, trying to deal with start getting overwhelmed by the stars that come through the door is very Lucy. Um, uh, so she had that kind of energy and her personality fitted Lucy as a comedian. So she was a, it's a similar style of comedy, very physical comedy. She and Peter obviously adored you. I mean, I know they do because I've spoken to them about you. But to think that you re-team for an assortment of projects like um, Life with Fran and then there was Happily Divorced. So right. you know, that chemistry was just so wonderfully portable from one situation to the right. next, to the next meaning. You all just had such 
an organic and gorgeous relationship. Yeah, I mean, we enjoyed each other. You know, you enjoyed each other as people. So it's fun to work together with someone that you enjoy. And um, and we had the sort of chemistry because there was always going to be this, you know, her with her voice, me with my voice, you know, my kind of upbringing, her upbringing was always going to be an interesting mix. You put it into any kind of situation. Yeah. Um, but now she's, you know, um, busy being the president of our union and yes. uh, doing cancer schmancer and uh, being a kind of health ambassador. She does these big health seminars. Um, so she's got even more strings to her bow right now, as well as the Broadway musical that they're developing. So, um, you know, she's a whirlwind. She really is. You hear that crazy voice and you see her wonderful comedy chops and you imagine she's this kind of lightweight, uh, but you don't realise what a fierce and ferocious woman she is and how smart. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Very smart. Um, and she's someone who relentlessly makes lemonade out of lemons. You know, everything, every curveball that life throws at her, um, from her illness to her divorce mm -hmm. to, I mean, everything. She's made, turned around. I mean, there she is with her husband. They, you know, had this, um, this kind of little landmine go off in their marriage when he uh, came out. Came out, yeah. Okay. And, you know, after they picked up the pieces, because they're each other's soulmates, it's mm. quite clear when you see them, they're still, you know, absolutely adore each other. So once the dust settled, you know, they said, let's make a show about it yep. and turned it into Happily Divorced, which was a really smart show. So she's 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 always able to turn lemons in, into lemonade, which is a remarkable talent. Now, what a lot of people might not know is that you do a very mean Fran Drescher impersonation. It's like your party trick, isn't it? Oh, Mr. Sheffield. <laughs> See, I love it. You know, simple things really do. They hit the heart. Oh, That's no, I know. Endless you also story. think of the nanny and you think of the wonderful cast. I mean, Daniel Davis as Niles was just impeccable. Did you love working with Daniel? Ja Danny and I had a lot of fun. We, we loved doing our bits together. And uh, again, as I said earlier, you know, a completely different chemistry, yeah. um, uh, but a lot of fun. And Danny brought a kind of solid professionalism to it all. Um, you know, if, if things got a little bit too silly, he would kind of like, you know, <laughs> you know, bring us all down and like, you know, we're professionals here, guys, you know. <laughs> but I adore Danny. Yeah, I, I haven't seen him forever. He's back in New York um, and had done a ton of stage as well as uh, TV and, and movies when he came to us. Yes. Um, but, you know, there was him, there was Lauren, who was just a darling. Oh, it was C.C. So Babcock, divine. Yeah. What a good character. C. C. Yeah. Um, there was her. The kids were great. Maddie, yes. Matt Zima, Nicole, Tom, Ben Salisbury. Yeah. We had three great kids. Yes. Uh, Rachel Chagall is the best friend, was a perfect foil for yeah. Fran. Um, it was Renee a, it, Taylor. I mean, and Renee, Renee, you know, Renee, who uh, came in and everyone, when she came on, was very... Not everyone, but there was a certain blowback, pushback from the Jewish community who thought that it was uh, an unfair stereotype. Yes, yeah, sending and, it all out. And then Fran introduced her real mom yeah. on some talk show. And it was like, oh, it's Renee. I yeah. mean, they're basically the same person. So that <laughs> argument suddenly disappeared because, you know, the real Sylvia had hair out here. <laughs> And, and was sort of, and, and, you know, Renee was a little bit of an exaggeration, but no, but it was really not that big an, an exaggeration. So that was funny. Um, but Renee is, you know, one of those people that doesn't have to open her mouth and you're laughing. There's just something about her that's just such a gifted comedian. Like and Anne it. Morgan um, Gilbert, who was uh, Yetta. Oh, and Annie Gilbert. Yes, Yetta, bless her heart. She's gone yeah. now, hasn't she? She's left. She's gone, sadly, yes. She um, left us some years ago. Yes. Um, you know, she never had a cigarette out of her mouth. <laughs> <laughs> never, never had a cigarette out of her mouth. 
I mean, Yedda didn't either, and Annie didn't, you know, and the both of them, she was one of those smokers who would go, ruff, ruff, ah, ruff, ah. <laughs> Your life is fascinating, Charles. Let's go back to the beginning, born in London. Uh, your dad was a famous writer of, of TV shows and stuff, and your mum, the wonderful Jean Lodge, fabulous actress. Tell me about what it was like being brought up in that showbiz household. We lived in London in Chelsea and, um, you know, I was away at school a lot. The British always sent their kids off to boarding school. Um, so I'd be back for the holidays. Um, but once a year, they'd have a showbiz party. They'd have these friends from different walks of life. Um, but they, they felt like a lot of their showbiz friends you know, wouldn't mix with some of their other friends too well. So once a year, there was a big showbiz party, which was so exciting. David and I, my brother and I, would be allowed to stay up and take the coach at the door and, and serve the drinks a little for a little before we went to bed. But we would hide under the piano or, you know, behind a couch until everyone had had just enough drinks to forget that we were there. And then we were good. Once they were, everyone was a little bit sourced we were good to go for the rest of the night. And it was just a blast. My dad would play the piano into the early hours of the morning and everyone singing. My dad played beautiful piano by ear. Every mm. Cole Porter, every Rogers and Hammerstein, Rogers and Hart, um, you name it, he, he could play it. Because um, so he wrote upstairs, from, downstairs, didn't he? As he I wrote remember. upstairs and he was the principal writer and script editor on upstairs, mm. downstairs and was there right from the beginning of that. Um, so yeah, and my mum was an actress, so she had friends from the movies that she did. Mm. Um, and it was just so exciting for us to see these people. I remember one year Roger Moore was came through um on a Blackman, uh, I don't know, you know, from Pussy Galore from yeah, James of course. Moore, Kenny Moore, who was a famous English film actor, not Wonderful. so well known over here. Um, was a great big, a very big friend of theirs and would take a lot of notice of us kids and be very sweet, we'd play the bongos and he was just a darling man. So yeah, it was very exciting growing up in that environment. But then I decided I'd acted all my way through school. I loved acting, but I always felt it was a little embarrassing. I always felt it was a bit like saying, I wanna be a show. People say, what do you wanna do when you grow up? Yes. And I thought if I say I wanna be an actor, it means I'm, I may as well say, I wanna be a show off. Mm -hmm. So I was a bit embarrassed about that. And I thought with the rest of the family doing it, I'll do something sensible. I'll be a lawyer, which is kind of acting. So I went to Cambridge and got a law degree and then quickly realized it wasn't my tribe. Although I did enjoy the, the, the law as, as a sort of study, but it wasn't my tribe of people. And I, I kind of did a reverse course and went back into the acting, went to drama school, which is where I met Susan, my wife mm -hmm. in London, yes. and, um, and became an actor. And the rest was um, touch wood. I, you know, I was very lucky at it. So how did you wind up in Hollywood? Susan, she was a second year student at the Central School of Speech and Drama. When I was in my second year, she came uh, to do her three years from America. Um, and she was this uh, ex-ballerina, you know, glamorous, California, long-legged, long-limbed, tanned, yes. gorgeous creature that us pimply-faced, um, you know, pale-faced English schoolboys had never seen anything like it. Um, so, uh, and I managed to score a date with her one day and we got along and we saw each other. And then um, when, uh, when I left, I went to work in England, she left and came back to work in America and we kept in touch on the phone. And then finally, after about six months, I just said, this is crazy. I, you know, I'm like walking through life in a kind of sleep. It's like, I'm not alive. Um, everything's black and white. Um, we need to do something about this. Will you marry me? And she said, yes. And then we had to decide, well, does she come to England or do I go to America? And England at that time in 83 was pretty miserable. Um, so I just, sold up everything and said goodbye to family and friends and just headed out west. And that was it. We made our lives in Los Angeles. And you've been married 39 years, coming on to 40. 39 years. Yeah, 39 Incredible. years. Two kids. 
two kids. Uh, one is pregnant. One is married and having a baby. Her first wow. baby in October. You're going to be uh, a granddad. I'm going to be a grandpa. We can't wait. We're so excited. It's ridiculous. Oh, that's um, right. Um, so that's exciting. She's uh, my eldest. And then my youngest, Maddie, she's here, has a, an English boyfriend. And they're quite serious. So, you know, touch with the family's good. They live in Los Angeles, which we're so grateful for. Yes. You know, it's, so many friends of ours have kids that have moved away out of town um, or even out of the country. And that's really would be so hard. They live a long way away in Los Angeles, but at least it's in the same city. Um, so yeah, we're looking forward to being grandparents. Um, we see them, uh, the kids, you know, every now and again, we get together for a brunch or a dinner or something. Um, so yeah, it's all so far touch wood, all good. One of the funniest stories I remember you telling me was actually of your honeymoon. Um, that wasn't <laughs> all that flashes I remember, Charlie. Was it a sweet in a hotel in downtown Los Angeles with drug deals going off and police. Oh, it was, yeah, it was just, it's still standing that hotel. It's, <laughs> it's, that, it's in Lafayette Park. Yeah. And it's like this sort of very seedy part of downtown LA and yeah. was then as well, even yeah. more seedy in 83. And we had this kind of big um, sort of uh, hotel catered wedding. Yeah. And then went up to the presidential suite on the eighth floor. And when he got into bed, we noticed these pretty lights on the ceiling. Susan said, what are those pretty blue and red lights on the ceiling? At which point we heard sirens and gunshots and screams and all night long <laughs> with drug deals going down, people stabbing each other, police cars, ambulances. It was like, I don't think we got a wink of sleep. We were just staring at the ceiling, absolutely terrified. And then that next day, uh, first day of our honeymoon, we had to go change a tire that had burst on a car that one of our friends had borrowed and literally just walked away from down on Normandy and 53rd, which is sort of gangland. Um, yes. So Susan kept a lookout while I changed the tire. Um, and then we drove back to her parents' house and moved into the spare room on the couch. And that was our honeymoon. And we both looked at each other and said, you know what, the great thing is, it can only get better. <laughs> <laughs> it's like all these people who wake up their first night of their honeymoon in Fiji, you know, or, or Sri Lanka on a beach. It's like, how can you how can you keep that up? But waking up with, you know, drug deals and changing the tire and <laughs> trying to keep out of a gang shooting. It could only get better, and it did. One of your first jobs um, in the US was selling blue movies. Yeah, no, I was selling adult videos on the telephone to, <laughs> I had a stack of yellow pages for all these different states, and I would go through motel, I'd go straight to M for motels in Little Rock, Arkansas, or Des Moines, <laughs> Iowa, and if I saw a motel called, you know, Naughty Knickers or something, <laughs> or like, you know, Love Nest, I thought, well, that's a good one to try. So I'd call up in my very English, I still had a very Prince Charles accent in those days, and said, you know, hello, this is Charles, and I'm uh, in wondering if you'd be interested uh, but we're doing a special on uh, naughty erotica um, and Swedish maids this week. We can give you uh, six for the price of five um, and a big picture of Tawny Kitten in the, in the nude. Um, if you buy some of these tapes and they'd all just laugh and hang up. They thought this is, they were being punked. So I never sold anything. I never, I was terrible at it. Uh, look, then the acting roles started to roll in, and I thank know that you wound up yes. on thank Murphy God. Brown. Yes, thank yes. God. Thank for God, that. I started to actually start working as an actor, and I got as I, I left that job and got a great job in a fabric store, fabric design oh. store, and they would. Um, uh, my job was to send the swatches. Mm -hmm. When a designer wanted swatches of the fabric, I would. Me and my colleague, and he wanted to be. He was a bass guitarist. Uh, wannabe and I was an actor wannabe and we would send these swatches out around the country and it was mind-numbingly boring so we came up with ways of amusing ourselves by arranging all the colors in different like we'd take all the swatches and then arrange them by material then we'd take them all down and arrange them in colors and then we'd take them all down and arrange that's what we did 
and then at night I was beginning to get work on in the theater in equity waivers and then I got a professional show and then from that I got into the Mark Taper which was the big downtown theater Fabulous. and then I got an agent then into a play with Alan Bates that came in to town with Alan Bates and Harry Andrews and all the sort of big stars and then Days of Our Lives happened around that time and then wow. that's when it all started to take off. And it did explode, didn't it? Because you became with Patsy Pees um, as uh, Shane and Kimberly. Shane and Kimberly. We That's were right. like one of those super couples. The 80s were the golden age. They've never been, not even bef before or since, because they were paying for nighttime. The daytime shows were making so much money and had such a huge following that they basically paid the networks to put on nighttime shows. So we were golden so if they said they wanted to do a location shoot in London we went to London we went to London they went to Greece we went to um, um, Florida I mean we would just go off and do two weeks of location shooting for a soap you know which was so much fun what was it like when you'd received you know the next week's scripts and these incredibly convoluted, crazy storylines oh it was great but it was always so much fun I would laugh a lot of us, we would, because you had to be very serious on tape when it came to like three o'clock and we were taping it, you had to like, but you'd got all the jollies out <laughs> during the day while you're rehearsing, you're able to just get all the, because it was, it was insane. So we would laugh like our ribs were aching by the time I got home, because some of the, I mean, Shane was, he was blown up, he was shot, oh. he went, he was in like four comas. He um, had amnesia. He thought he was a short order cook called Sam. Um, he had an identical twin, psychotic identical twin brother. I mean, every storyline you can think of, um, I got to play, which was so much fun. Days of our lives was just like, it was it. What was that level of fame like? You must have been mobbed wherever yeah. you were. It, it was absolutely extraordinary because we had nothing like it in England I mean there was nothing to compare it to and nothing to prepare me for it um and what was you know we would go off at weekends and do these appearances uh it was a way of making some extra money it was a way of keeping in touch with the fans so you would sort of show up in Akron Ohio to do an appearance at a large um you know Walmart and they would have a table in one of the aisles and there would be thousands of fans all around the building and, you know, jamming the parking lot. And you'd be like a kind of pop star. The security would come and sort of put something over your head and rush you in the back door. And then you'd sit at this table and they would announce, you know, uh, Shane Donovan, Charles Shaughnessy, Shane Donovan is in the gardening aisle, aisle eight in the gardening aisle of aisle eight. Please come and say hi and see, he'll sign some pictures here. And there's thousands of people and you're sitting in there signing these autographs, these pictures for people. And every now and again, someone would push a chair by and go, excuse me, who are you? <laughs> and you go, oh, you watch ABC, don't you? Yeah, we watch ABC's our stories. And you go, well, yeah, you don't know who I am. Don't worry about it. These are all NBC people. And that was the, that's the thing that kept your feet on the ground, is that you would be like a superstar, but only if they were NBC watchers. Yes. If they were CBS or ABC, they didn't know you from, you know, the mailman. I mean, it's like, I don't know who you are. But the NBC people were like, you don't know, he's, he's Shane Donovan. They go, search me. Now, if it was, you know, Susan Lucci, if it was all my children, it'd be a whole different deal. So oh. it was, but it was unreal. It was absolutely unreal. The, the pandemonium when you, when you hit the stage, sometimes it would be on a stage. They had sort of, you know, and a spotlight would hit you and just 10,000 people going absolutely bonkers. What was Patsy Pease like to work with? She was great. She was like so, in, you know, uh, a wonderful actress, you know, mm -hmm. just so um, intense in and, and, and what she did with Kimberly. It was a very, uh, you know, sometimes very hard because she was an extremely uh, emotional, fragile character. Um, so it was hard for Patsy to... I mean, it must have been exhausting for her to to go some of the places she did, but she was great. 
we, you know, we had a, a chemistry that lasted for, you know, eight years. And of course, they still from time to time or were until reasonably recently, uh, bringing Shane back for funerals and weddings and he right. was resuscitated <laughs> from the grave how many times? I mean, yeah. you get the call and think, oh, Shane's back in business again. Yeah, they would, even if I wasn't on the show, they'd call occasionally, apparently. I heard from friends that they'd, you know, a phone would go and go, hi, Shane, how's it going in Europe, you know? And of course, Charles, you are now causing a stir as Victor Cassidyne in General Hospital. And funnily enough, GH was the first show I did here. Yeah, the first TV show I did in America was a week on General Hospital playing Holly Scorpio's cousin, Alistair. Uh -huh. He was this ne'er-do-well who was going around conning all the old ladies in Port Charles out of their jewelry. Uh, Scorpio, Robert Scorpio, you know, caught on. He and Holly caught on and, you know, threw him out of town. But that was my first TV job. Wow. So I have a very soft spot for General Hospital. Yeah, so and you I come back. Too. When I was doing my my little swatches um, in uh, at Design Tech, G8 would have our lunch at one and we'd watch G8. So I became a big fan anyway. Well, you playing Victor have in fact taken over from fabulous Aussie actor, Teo yeah, Pimpers, who Teo. played Victor for however long and was in Days of Our Lives as Count Anthony de Mira, of course. That's it. Yeah, you know, it was, uh, he was Victor Cassadine um, and then got, you know, shot and poisoned and blown up um, and God knows what. Uh, and then years later, it turns out, well, you know, you didn't get rid of him, you know, but it's a different actor. It's me. Um, meanwhile, Teo's back on days. Um, and we sort of keep, we keep, you know, passing each other like ships in the night. I should keep an eye on him because I think I'll, I'll just sort of get my next job. When he gives up a job, <laughs> I'll, just sort of, I'll just step into it. <laughs> uh, what's it like playing Victor Cassadine? Is it a role you're loving? Oh, yeah, it's so much fun. He's obviously a dangerous guy. Um, but he's sort of urbane and uh, very European, very sophisticated um, and, and has a great sense of humour. There's a sort of wit and a charm, but he's deadly, um, which is just so much fun to play. And it's with wonderful actors. I mean, they're a terrific bunch of people there. I mean, very welcoming, immediately very welcoming and so fun to work with. Um, each and every one of them. I've been lucky to have scenes with quite a sort of wide um, spectrum of different actors. And again, each one, we have our chemistry. You know, every time you... The thing about chemistry is it's really just two good actors listening to each other. Mm -hmm. And if you have two actors who know what they're doing and they're listening to the rhythms in the conversation, each other's speech patterns and rhythms and energy... And it's like jazz, it's exactly like jazz. And you're listening and you're coming in at the right moments and you're allowing beats and you're allowing pauses. And that rhythm is chemistry. So each actor brings its own, his own melody, his own sort of technique, if you like. And if you listen and play with each other, you can have great chemistry with a bunch of different people. Um, and that's what I'm most enjoying about it is working with all these different really good actors and, and finding a kind of um, chemistry with each and every one of them. Did your mum and get, dad get to see your great success? They did for both. Um, um, and I remember when my parents, my mum and dad came out to California, the first time they came out after we were married, we went to San Francisco and we were in a trolley car and suddenly there were flash bulbs going off and my dad, blessed up for a moment, thought maybe it's for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then they saw that it was me and he was very proud. You know, he's like, I said, this is my dad. And they said, oh, can we take a picture of the two of you? So he had like, absolutely, you know, we put our arms around. And he was thrilled, they were thrilled. I mean, they hadn't seen anything like it either, this sort of fan reaction. Um, it's not what the English do. The English are a little more buttoned down. Mm. So um, they were sort of shocked and thrilled and, and very proud of, uh, of this sort of bizarre celebrity that their son suddenly had.
thrust upon him. Well, I mean, it's interesting because your mum, Jean Lodge, was one of the great British beauties of the screen. Lovely right. to know that she was also part of your success too in America. Yes, absolutely. And she's still going. I talk to her every week, twice a week. She's 95 in August, still, you know, uh, living on her own, doing fantastically well. Um, and yes, and what's so nice now is that because of YouTube and some of these old movie channels, uh, she's able to find some of those old movies. They were all back in the early Ealing days. When I came I along, she sort of stepped back from acting and gave it up. But through the 50s um, and very early 60s, she was in a lot of those Ealing um, and uh, Elstree movies, British movies. Um, and I have to say, I've seen a couple of them recently. Um, and she was really good. She's She was not only this dark beauty I mean she was absolutely stunningly beautiful but she had a very natural almost American ease about the way she played because a lot of English actors in those days were frightfully like this and dead of the arch um, and she has a very natural rhythm which was um, interesting to see she should have probably gone on she probably shouldn't have given it up when she did but there you go I listen to your stories and and uh, and and it's lovely reflecting back on your life that keeps on keeping on and goes from strength to strength. I really do think if I can exhort you of anything, it is to find that keyboard and commit it to a memoir because your stories are wild. I know you only tell me that much of them. There are yeah. a mountain to be had and heard, but it's it's lovely to chat with you again, Charlie. It Always really a pleasure, is. Craig. You know, I I mean it. You, it this is my favorite uh, interview. Always, I look forward to it. Promise me, we'll do it again next year. Oh, can I we? Let's make it. it. It's like that movie. Same time next year. Same time next year. There you go. We could do oh, that yeah. because there's always lots to chat about with you. And um, and once again, it has been an unmitigated joy. Likewise, thank you, bless you, and uh, stay well, stay healthy.